Our gospel this first week of Lent, this first, beginning a full month of Lent, <laughs> and a couple more weeks in April, is from Matthew, the fourth chapter. Listen for the word of God. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterward he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And... On their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly the angels came and waited on him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, Gloria Day. <laughs> It is a great gift to be back with you again this day. The last time I was here, the last several times I've been here, I've been worshiping with you all, even in today's service, as this is the family favorite for my parents. Um, so it's good to be with you today. Um, I want to bring you greetings from our whole family. Pastor Seth, uh, many of you who know him, is preaching today, probably like right about now, at Grace of God Lutheran Church in Columbus, Ohio. And then later this week, uh, he's serving um, our whole church, our whole ELCA, um, by investing in future leaders of our church as they visit Trinity Seminary, your seminary, my seminary. Uh, this year, I have been privileged to be serving as an interim university pastor to all of Capital University. Is there, are there any Capital family in the house? Any Cap fam here? I know you're Wittenbergers, like me, right? Uh, my heart is three days. We're figuring out how to say Capital University rather than Wittenberg University. CAP really is a wonderful school. We have a great new president, um, uh, Elizabeth Paul, and we have amazing student leaders. So our future is bright, and tomorrow, students return from spring break. <laughs> tomorrow begins the final eight weeks of the semester. And I want to share a story, actually, about our time at Capitol this year. Thursday nights, we spend in worship at 9.09 .09 to 10.10 10 p.m., <laughs> And students gather together for a service called Candlelight. It's been going on for, I think, two decades. Uh, the leaders love the chapel dark, like dark, dark. Illuminated, glowing with only the glow of like 30-some tea lights and a TV screen. <laughs> a year ago, if you told me, hey, you know, in a year, you're going to preach in near darkness where it's hard to read your Bible to college students, and you're probably just going to have like a couple of words written down and just a question. I probably would laugh and have told you politely, you're crazy. You are crazy. Mm -hmm. Yet here we all are together on Thursday nights, and just three weeks ago, our question to wonder about together was something like this. If you could ask God one question to be answered, what would it be? So a question to glean more questions, that's, okay, that's postmodern. Yet still the very question that we kept on circling back around to for nearly 30 minutes was, why? Why, God? Why do you allow suffering to persist in the world? This question really never gets old right? It echoes to us from the life Eve and Adam were granted to live after this moment in our first lesson from Eden. 
And so at Capitol, we spent that Thursday night talking for nearly a half an hour with wildly different theologies. And here we are again today, looking at it through our privileged Lutheran lens. And today and every first Sunday in Lent, I'm reminded that Lent does not arrive or begin quietly. Every year this time with God, we begin by naming with God and addressing with God sin and evil and temptation. Yes, Lent is a season for preparation and renewal. The ancient church, think Book of Acts, Lent was the prime time for preparation for those preparing to be baptized. And yes, Lent is this great 40 days time before Easter. Yet think about Lent for a moment. Think about this passage of time. Has it ever once been the same journey? Never once have I found Lent to be a dull discovery. Never once have I seen a repeat like I can find on television, right? I have grown to appreciate every year a new Lenten discipline. You know, some folks give something up for Lent. Other people add a spiritual practice. You all have a spiritual practice I have never seen before here. I'm coming down to get a visual aid. Uh, These white pieces of paper are in your pew racks, and uh, they're sandwiched in there, so look closely. And you're invited this year, this year, this week, these five weeks of Lent, these 40 days, to write down a worry, a concern, a fear, something that you would like to confess before God, only before God. And then you're invited to put them in, into this vase, and together these, these will line the cross on Good Friday, and then they will be destroyed um, and given over to God laid before the cross on Easter Vigil um, in celebration that God is the one who receives all of our, all of our temptations, all of uh, what we need to be forgiven for, um, all of our worries, all of our doubts, all of our concerns. These are what we can entrust only to God through Christ our Lord. And so we celebrate that God hears those, that Jesus receives them, and this, this is a bold witness for this time of Lent. And so I would encourage this to be one of many spiritual practices you consider. And maybe you're thinking, oh my gosh, Lent's already started. Ash Wednesday was last Wednesday with that great potluck that Tina mentioned. But truly, there is time here. There is still plenty of time to begin something new with intention and great prayer. Today, Matthew's Gospel gives us this glimpse of the 41st day Jesus faced temptation upon. For 40 days he had been in the desert, in the wilderness, and he, where he had eaten nothing and drank nothing, and then at his lowest point of humanity, the, t- the devil comes to, to destroy Jesus. And on that one day, Jesus is tempted three times in three powerful ways. You know, the devil comes first asking about, will you create something? Will you create this bread out of stones? And Jesus says, no, I will not. The devil comes asking for Jesus to share how powerful he is, you know, to revert the course of gravity, should be no match for you. And Jesus says, no, no, thank you, I will not. And then Jesus is asked by the devil to, to worship the devil, to deny God, in all countless ways. And to this, Jesus says, no, I will not. And so we see in Jesus who we cannot be, because we are not like Jesus. We are human. We could not ever be this strong. Yet in this moment, we are reminded always, this very first Sunday in Lent, that temptation is real, and our need to ask God for forgiveness is real. And all this, those that we've sinned against, we need to address that with them, that this too is real. And so despite how well we know all of this, maybe in our minds, we have to feel it in the depths of our soul, and that is what Lent is about. Because God knew best that the devil always works in crafty ways. I heard this great quote by Kenneth Halstead, who writes this book called From Stuck to Unstuck. He says, evil may be wrong, but it is not stupid, at least not at its most powerful. 
It does not deal in honest, straightforward, or fair competition. It fights dirty and deceptively using every clear, double-binding trick to trap us and rob us of our humanity and our eternal birthright. Today, we see that from those earliest days beginning in the garden to Jesus' temptation and also in naming our own, that we are enticed with great things that can appear to be good, not things that appear to be evil. And that it is why, on this first Sunday in Lent, our church is just such a wonderful place to be. Because here we are remember together how we have the power through God to resist temptation, to speak words of scripture to one another and ourselves, to literally spend time figuring out together how to turn around and leave a situation. Maybe it is to utter in our own minds and hearts to follow how Luther once spoke, to say to something, to someone, here I stand, I cannot go along with this, and to honor God in those commitments. And in those moments, God sustains us as we're trying our best to figure out how to live and to repent and to trust in God's forgiveness. God remains with us. As I read this Gospel of Matthew for you all here at Gloria Day, I kept being drawn to several key words. And I want to invite you to pray about them this week, this whole month, this season of Lent. Maybe the gift of alliteration can help us all remember them together. But there are four words. Wilderness, worship, word, and witness. All together, your congregation of Gloria Day is experiencing a time of transition. Maybe it feels a little something like wilderness. Maybe not. Maybe everyone's getting along here and no one is getting worn out. At some point, having so many guest pastors maybe might start to be a little bit of a drain. Maybe having a certain person here in the pulpit, maybe it's exciting, maybe it's not. It could be a reason to skip worship for a week or two. You know, find someone or some new place to visit. We can ask God from anywhere why. And so at some point, it will be good for you all to name aloud that grief happens in different ways. And pinch yourself. You're human. So it's good to remember different things, that you all worship differently, that you notice things differently differently. And that transitions like yours place us all in vulnerable spaces because we're human. And so maybe it could be a little like you've moved to a new town, yet you never left the pew or the place you're living in. Every time a pastor leaves a congregation, there is loss and grief, and it's all completely normal. It's completely normal. It means what was in the past was awesome and well and good. And it means there is hope and new life in the future. And so in this time of Lent, I would hope that you would try this word wilderness on for size and remember that God is on the job, standing with you, walking with you, walking with the leaders that God's Spirit has raised up to lead all of you together. Our worship, our witness depends on God's word spoken among us. God's word spoken and lived and storied among us. And so when we live each of these words, new life is only bound to happen. And celebrating each of these words, we will witness God moving among you. God restoring and reordering creation and all things. And every transition... And every wild place holds new life because that is who God promises always to be, the Lord of new life among the church. And so today in the wilderness, there is nothing quiet about our Lenten preparations. God would have it no other way. And so Jesus leads us all to draw together, to draw near to God by worship and word for our witness. Amen.
In peace let us pray to the Lord. In peace let us pray to the Lord. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Oh,